Good afternoon, and thank you for the McKernan family and the organizers for providing this amazing opportunity to present today, and thank you all for listening. So my name is Deb Kimless. I'm the medical director of Forward Grow, a cultivation and processing company in Maryland, and I'm also a medical advisor for Pure Green, the manufacturer of the tablets I'm about to talk about. And I usually talk about nutrition, microbiome, and ruining everybody's lunch, but today I'm gonna to talk about pain. So I'm an anesthesiologist by board certification, and the fact that there are over 110 million people in our country suffering with chronic pain is troublesome. That's a third of our population. And people are also suffering with comorbidities, associated with chronic pain, including insomnia, anxiety, and depression, which of course leads to more pain. And the interesting thing about this is that even though 110 million people are a lot of people, Big Pharma has really not come up with a novel pain medicine since the development of naproxen sodium, and that was in the 1970s. Yes, there's modifications of this molecule, but there really has been no new pharmacologic medication that's safely and reliably addressing painful conditions. And so in this month's Consumer Reports, hardly a medical journal, they tried to summarize specific pain relieving target options, which they uh, broke down into four categories, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, opioids, and muscle relaxers. And interesting, you know, Consumers is not a medical journal. They, they neglected to mention that there are some FDA approved uh, medicines for painful conditions, so for fibromyalgia, pregabalin, duloxetine, and milnasopran, and for neuropathic pain, pregabalin, and duloxetine. However, the rates and successes of this pain relieving medications are variable at best. And that pretty much everything else we prescribe for pain relief are off-label uses. And what does that mean? The anti-epileptics and the antidepressants that we write for have are associated with no double-blind randomized trials supporting their use, nor are they FDA approved for the indication of pain, but we still prescribe them. And in fact, one out of every five prescriptions that we prescribe as physicians are for off-label use. Fun fact. And commensurate with the, the FDA approved medications as well as the off-label, there's a whole host of side effects. And for some reason, <laughs> they're never good. <laughs> Thank you. And we should never underestimate the fact that patients who take over-the-counter medicines actually believe that they're safe and have either minimal or zero uh, risk, which is why, of course, they believe it's over-the-counter and not prescription. However, um, I read in a, a recent study that said that there's 50 to 80% of patients do not take their medications as prescribed. And this is for prescriptions, not over-the-counter stuff. And so I can, I can almost guarantee that nobody reads a label as evidenced by who here only takes one ibuprofen for a headache ever, right? However, there are risks. And so we all are aware of the risk of liver failure commensurate with an overdose of um, Tylenol and NSAIDs causing cardiac dysrhythmias, including ibuprofen, because most people take it in prescription doses, as well as the risk of NSAIDs, even as taken as directed on the label, of which of course no one does, um, associated with an increase of myocardial infarction. And now the, the NIH has come out with um, the overdose death rates from all prescription medicines, and they continue to increase. And then when you take out uh, opiates, again, they continue to increase over the years. And these increases in opioid-related deaths is in spite of our country's leadership declaring that opioid crisis as a public health emergency. So I don't think that declaration is really doing much because as the CDC has written, that every day more than 1,000 people go to the emergency room 
for not using prescription opioids as directed. And so if we do some math, which I'm not a fan of, but if we do anyway, the average ER visit costs about $1,900 across the country, which means that we're spending $2 million a day for this indication only. And yet 115 people die each day from opioid overdose. And interestingly, I call this under the category of unintended consequence. Beyond all of the other reasons why there's a rise in opiate addiction and overdose, I found this in JAMA surgery that basically said that when they rescheduled hydrocodone to a schedule two, physicians were writing for more, not less pain pills. And so with the exception of bariatric surgery, for every other surgery, there was a statistically uh, significant increase in pill writing, and the reason was because they couldn't call in hydrocodone and they didn't want patients to have to go to an ER or have to go back to the office to get pain relief, or also to make them so that they don't look bad because they don't wanna look like they didn't know what to do. So uh, back again to consumer reports. In that magazine, they said that they are addressing the possibility of cannabis as a novel medication for pain relief. As the a medical community, we should be ashamed that, com that Consumer Reports actually addresses this first. And so I was troubled, as we all are, about the opioid crisis, as well as needing solutions for patients who may or may not have access to every iteration of cannabis medicine due to their geography. And so I figured, what is it that we can do that is needed? So we need something that's effective, reliable, and safe, something that's easy to use to improve compliance so people take it as directed, a reliable composition so everybody feels comfortable taking it, something that can be titratable, non-intoxicating, because most patients don't want to be sidelined by their pain, but they also don't want to be sidelined by their pain medicine. And ideally, something that's affordable. And so I was given the opportunity to create a novel pain reliever, so I formulated this. CBD at five milligrams, palmitil ethanolamide, which from now on will be called PEA because that's too difficult to pronounce, and then terpenes, um, four iterations, which I'll go into in a sec, um, total of 0.1 milligram in a rapidly dissolvable sublingual tablet. And so why PEA? Well, I believe in the entourage effect, and as an anesthesiologist, we use medicine synergistically. We administer a little bit of many drugs to try to enhance positive effects and minimize adverse effects. And at a CanMed conference in Boston a couple of years ago, Dr. Mishulam showed a slide of molecules that he called endocannabinoid-like. He said they were naturally occurring, that they are bioactive, and he wondered why no one was studying them. So I quickly wrote them down in a notebook because I'm a bit of a geek, and I began my research. And what I found was with PEA, an endocannabinoid-like molecule, really isn't something new. It was new to me, but it wasn't new. It was discovered in the 1950s and actually has been used for pain relief by itself, albeit at higher concentrations. And for those of you that don't know, PEA is a fatty acid amide, like its endocannabinoid relatives, has a complex multimodal mechanism of action. It activates intracellular, nuclear, and membrane-associated receptors and regulates many physiologic functions related to the inflammatory cascade and chronic pain states. So for example, it directly targets PPAR alpha, GPR55, GPR119, it indirectly affects CB1 and 2 receptors through enhancing anandamide through the entourage effect by competing with FA. PEA downmodulates mast cell activation, inhibits release of inflammatory mast cell mediators, histamine and TNF alpha, and mast cells are often found near sensory endings, sensory nerve endings, and their degranulation can enhance the nociceptive signal and the reason why peripheral mast cells are considered to be pro inflammatory and pro nociceptive. So this just skims the surface of PEA's magical and complicated mechanism of action and how it can play a role in mitigating pain. However, I found this incredibly interesting. So we combined PEA, CBD, and four terpenes, beta-caryophylline, humulene, myrcene, and linalool in a rapidly dissolvable sublingual tablet. The goal was to treat mild to moderate pain to compete with Tylenol and ibuprofen. I actually didn't believe this was gonna work. I trialed it first on me, and then on 16 patients, 
um, nine females, seven males, eight, mean age 53.2. Patients had a variety of painful conditions, uh, back and neck pain, arthritis, musculoskeletal, neuropathic, dysmenorrhea, and one person had a hangover during the trial. And then we used the Wong Baker pain scale for easy rating. And so the average pretreatment pain scale score was 5.13. After one tablet, the average pain score dropped to two. That's more than half in 20 minutes or less. The score dropped again to almost by, almost by half to 1.25 in another 20 minutes, and then again to 0.44 after an hour, and then two hours dropped to 0.25, and this was statistically significant. And these, this is a, a graph of the individual pain scale scores for every patient, and this was the average score over two hours. And this formulation approximates uh, the onset of traditional mild to moderate pain relievers. Ours is a little bit faster. Um, we didn't officially check beyond two hours because again, I really didn't think this was gonna work. Um, but we did ask patients to take down notes um, as to when their pain returned. Most documented somewhere between four and six hours. And two people claimed that with a single tablet, it lasted 24 hours. And so, of course, we worry about side effects, right? So we want to make sure everything is safe. A survey of the literature looked at the side effects of PEA, and there are no reports of severe adverse reactions. And in fact, um, the rate of adverse events are even less than placebo in a double-blind study. And so we're all understanding the favorable safety profile of CBD, right? That's why we're here today. So now we're actually looking at this uh, with an expanded study, multi-site, and if anybody's out there in a legal state that wants to participate, please see me afterwards. And the preliminary results seem to mirror the prior study. And so the medical statement has always been, first, do no harm. But the question is, how? So perhaps Dr. Mishulam, Consumer Reports, and all of us here today have illuminated a path. And I thank you, and wow, I really beat the clock. It's, I'm from Jersey, so I speak quickly. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be great. Yes, sir. When you use the pain, um, the reason, uh, the number of pain patients in the United States. Do you know if any of, a lot of the states that allow for medical marijuana classify pain as a kind of catch-all uh, condition? And I, I'm wondering if that affects that statistic. I think they do. I actually think they do classify it as a single, like, pain. I don't think they break it down to neuropathic or whatever. Although I did see studies that the majority of the pain conditions, the top two are back pain and the second one is neuropathic pain. Thank you. Um, um, I just wanted to ask if you could suss out the neuropathic pain responses from others, other types of pain. So we didn't do it. We had a couple patients with neuropathic pain and their pain was reduced significantly, didn't go away completely, but uh, theirs was the less steep of the curves, but we are gonna do that study. There's somebody. Hi, you mentioned um, four terpenes very quickly. Um, could you please repeat those? And then my second question is, is this tablet in a CBD isolate? Is it derived from industrial hemp or is it derived from therapeutic? So the four cannabinoids are beta caryophylline humulene, linalool, and myrcene. The um, CB is, CBD is isolated from a cannabis plant, so not hemp. Uh, I'm wondering what, if any, are previously known uses of PEA that may have inspired this at all? So, um, pain, predominantly, and uh, works in metabolic issues as well, but the studies that I researched, it's quite co comp bleh, comprehensive, but um, they use PEA a lot for, for pain mitigation and inflammation. And then a follow-up, are you guys working on any alternate formulations? Absolutely. Thank you. 
Thanks for your talk, Deb. Um, is this available to patients now? It is. Um, so the company's out of Michigan, and um, we can talk about that another time. But yes, absolutely. If the CBD iteration, they, they, they ship across state line. And is the PEA, is that something you can eat? Is it in a food? So PEAs, uh, we make it and plants make it and um, people use it as a nutritional supplement and you can eat it and yeah, take it as pain medicine. Three minutes. So the, the study you were talking about, the multi-site study that you're doing? Yes. I might have missed something, but is it, do you have a control? Is it randomized or is it just like a single arm study where you're just... Right now, it's a single arm study to, for a pr real proof of concept. I mean, 16 patients is, you know, is, is interesting, but doesn't really speak to everything. So first step is to, to do a, a proof of concept, expand that one, and then ultimately we'll develop a placebo, which should be pretty easy, and then um, do a double blind randomized trial. And what is the advantage of deriving your CBD from um, marijuana rather than you know, hemp without, with lower THC? So um, the advantage is that the, the company in Michigan has access to a lot of cannabis-derived CBD, and so therefore that. A lot of people who clapped here probably believe that there are molecules that go along with it than when you do extraction, and so from the cannabis plant is a little bit different from the hemp plant. If it's a complete isolate, CBD is a molecule, CBD is CBD, but Thank you for your work. Thank you. Have you done the pain test with just PEA tablets without the CBD to see the results? I have not, but there are lots of studies out there that have shown it, but it's at 300 milligram to 1200 milligram a day. Again, this is why I didn't think it was gonna work because ours is just 100 milligrams. Um, but I, again, I'm, I'm thinking about the entourage effect with the CBD in combination with the PEA and the terpenes. Um, speaking of the entourage uh, effect, how many different strains of cannabis are you currently testing these with? I'm sorry, say that again? Are you using one strain of cannabis to test this with your medication or multiple types? And if so, how many? Right. So one I minute. know that they had one purveyor of cannabis and it was one strain that the extraction was made from. But good question and good thought. I like where you're going with yeah, that. Yeah, there's, there's major differences. Absolutely. Anything else? Great, thank you so much for your attention.